Good evening, guys. This is Going After Cacciato Flipped Classroom Lecture, covering chapters 19 through 30. Uh, this is a 14-slide lecture because it was a lot of chapters. I'm going to try and go as fast as possible, but I, uh, I apologize in advance because it's probably going to run a little bit over the uh, allotted 15 minutes that I told you guys. But without any further ado, let's jump in. Chapter 19 is an observation post chapter. At this point in the novel, it is 3 a.m., so we're into the, the early morning hours in terms of Paul Berlin's story. Chapter 19 really focuses on Paul Berlin repeating to himself that this could be done. It could be done. A repeated insistence. Uh, this repetition of the word possibilities shows up a lot. And it, we really get the idea that Paul is trying to convince himself that this is possible. Because if he can convince himself, he can convince other people. Paul's really trying to show that he thinks this can happen. And we see that in the upcoming chapters in terms of his story starts to hit snags, he starts to have problems, his narrative starts to break down a little bit, and it really is imperative that he convince himself that this is achievable. Chapter 22 is a very important chapter, Landing Zone Bravo. Or I'm sorry, I said 22. Chapter 20, very important chapter, Landing Zone Bravo. One of the most interesting things here is we really get a picture of a conflict. You'll notice that the novel is almost entirely devoid of scenes of war, except for this one scene in the landing zone. One of the things that I want to draw attention to is the way that the gunners are described. The gunners are really described very robot or machine-like uh, in their firing, the way that they fire, the way they look. You'll notice that the gunners are described as not having faces, as being expressionless. He uses words like fused to their big machine, the steady sweeping motions of a machine, molded to their guns, part of the machinery. He keeps bringing up this idea that these are not people, they're not human, that they are just killing machines, quite literally. We know that these are the door gunners who kill Jim Pedersen. And this is what he was killed in. You can't see that up there. It got cut off a little bit at the top of the picture. But this is what they were in. This is the helicopter that they were in. The helicopter is called a Chinook. It is a big twin rotor helicopter. You can see it's got rotor and then rotor up here. It's a heavy lift helicopter designed to carry lots of personnel or lots of equipment places. Uh, and they talk a lot about the door gunners. I just wanted to kind of show you guys what it looks like. So the troops are going to exit out of the back here. That's when they're going to jump out into the paddy. Uh, and there's a door gunner up here sitting in an actual little door. And then you can just kind of see the edge of another gunner right there. Uh, and then so there's another gunner on the other side of the helicopter as well. So these were the gunners. The troops are jumping out of the back. The gunners are spraying the bullets wildly. You can't see, but I'm making hand motions right now. Um, and that's kind of the situation they were in when Jim Pedersen got shot. You can imagine the amount of wind that this helicopter generates and kind of the chaos and confusion that you would see jumping out of this helicopter into a, a hot landing zone. Uh, really, Tim O'Brien trying to convey the craziness of war through that scene. Chapter 21, Railroad to Paris. This is a Paris chapter. We know what that means. We know it means it is a fictional chapter. This is an interesting chapter because we see that the story is losing its speed. Paul Berlin is kind of hitting a patch where he's not sure how to make things move forward. And he does that in the story. This happens through the vehicle they're traveling in literally slowing down. They're on this New Delhi Express, uh, barely eight hours, barely taking them 200 miles. That's 25 miles an hour. That is a very slow way to travel. 
Um, and really what we can see is that Paul's story is kind of getting stuck. And his story is really starting to slow down. I apologize about the handwriting, guys. It's not working out well today. Um, the whole story is starting to lag a little bit. He's not quite sure what to do. And then he finds that really weird rhyme in the bathroom and decides that Cacciato is on the train. And then they start searching the train to find Cacciato. And this is where we get this really interesting transition. You'll notice that... The start of this quote that I show you on page 138, the prying open the luggage is definitely on the train. People have luggage on trains. And then he says the jugs of rice. So that's a little weird, but it is the Delhi Express. Uh, so they probably could be carrying jugs of rice. But then there's a very clear break because he says, Friscom said Lieutenant Sidney Martin. So all of a sudden, we start on the train, but the next thing we know our characters are back in Vietnam, and Paul is thinking about frisking civilians in Vietnam. And then they even tell us among the muddy banks of the Song Trabong, which is the river that the, most of the action of Vietnam takes place on. So in this imaginary chapter, Paul's mind slips back into Vietnam. And we have this contrast between the way that the train people act where they advance on the squad and attack them, versus the way that the village reacts. The village that he remembers searching is actually the village where Buff is killed. And so we can understand why he would think back to this village. What this shows us is he would really like it if the Vietnamese acted like the mob. But the mob is imaginary. But the imaginary mob storms the train and gets angry at them. But instead, the way the Vietnamese people react is very sneakily, very quietly, uh, they, they just get their retaliation uh, in that way that ends up with Buff getting his face blown off and being dead in his helmet. Um, so this is a very interesting chapter. It's full of conflict, full of Paul kind of struggling with the things he's done in Vietnam. Chapter 22, who they were or claim to be. This is an interesting chapter, and it doesn't fit the flow of the novel. It is a real-world chapter. It's Paul thinking about the real members of 3rd Squad back when Lieutenant Sidney Martin is still alive. Um, but he also mentions Lieutenant Corson as well. It's really kind of an overview chapter. And just some interesting things in this chapter. They talk about how a soldier is called by the name he preferred, that really, like, their identity is created. They get to create who they are. And what they were called was in some way a measure of who they were or who they preferred to be. So again, this sense of a created identity where your identity is who you are, but if you're creating it, you get to make up some things. And we really understand, remember, Paul at this time, we know he joins the war at the age of 20. Paul is really trying to find himself, and he's surrounded by men his same age who are doing the same thing. They're trying to be who they think they ought to be. And we don't think much about the other members of 3rd Squad, but it's worth remembering that they're all of a similar age and are probably all, to some extent, going through the things that Paul is going through. And this is a chapter that really shows us how complex the other characters are, even though we don't see that uh, chapter to chapter. Asylum on the Road to Paris. We're back into our Paris chapters again. Just another indication, a little slight hint that this is all fictional. It was the India that Paul had always believed in. It's, it's his version of India. It's the way he thinks things would look. It's the way he thinks people would act. It's not real India, but it's what he thinks India should look like. This very unusual encounter where they walk into a hotel and there's a woman behind the counter who jumps up and yells Americans and it says that uh, she immediately reminded Paul of his own mother. This is kind of interesting because out of nowhere we get this reference to his 
family again and kind of shows up. We know Jolly immediately reminds him of his mother. We also know that Lieutenant Corson then falls in love very quickly with Jolly, we're told. Remember, this is all in his imagination. So Lieutenant Corson is a real person existing in Paul's also fictional imagination. These are some other quotes from Lieutenant Corson down here. And it's kind of interesting, if we think about Lieutenant Corson as a father figure, he really is a person that Paul talks to quite a bit. And so it's kind of interesting that in Paul's own imagination, he kind of has this jolly Corson family that he creates. Uh, in terms of Jolly reminds him of his mother. Corson reminds him of his father. Or Corson doesn't remind him of his father, but Corson is a father figure to him, and he kind of creates this uh, this happiness uh, in this chapter. Maybe the happiness that's lacking in his own family, as we've spent some time talking about before. Chapter 24, Calling Home. This is a chapter a lot of you are probably familiar with. A lot of you used it for your short response number three. Kind of an interesting chapter. It's so unusual to think now in the time of cell phones that there was a time when it was difficult to communicate uh, across the globe, across the planet, across the nation, whatever it was. And the soldiers have a chance to use a long-distance phone line and uh, call home. We know that the soldiers are able to call home. Uh, we know Eddie calls home. He's the first one to call home. And then we know that Doc and Oscar get a chance to call. Uh, and we're told that other people get a chance to call as well. And it really is a very emotional experience. We get to see, again, we're seeing this other side of the soldiers. We're seeing them as people, as sons, as people who are missing their family. Uh, and it is very emotional. And we see that in the descriptions the, eye, the face being bright red, keeps clearing his throat, his eyes were shiny, right? He kind of has the teary eyes, uh, made Paul Berlin feel warm to watch them. Lots of emotional connotation. And then we have Paul call. And as a lot of you wrote about, no one answers when Paul calls home. What's so interesting is that even without anyone answering the phone, it says Paul was smiling at the sound of the ringing. Now, we could look at this in terms of him smiling in anticipation, and he's happy, and he's eager. It's interesting if we think about it in terms of not him being happy at, at the thought of talking to his parents, but maybe he's happy that nobody picks up. Because if nobody picks up, Paul gets to continue his fantasy. He gets to continue this idea that he's going to impress his dad. He gets to continue this idea that he's going to be brave and show his dad the silver star. And he doesn't have to call home and explain any of these things to his family. He gets just to keep pretending that everything's okay. So I think it's interesting to think about that in terms of him avoiding this emotion and he's able to keep this lie going a little bit longer. The way it mostly was, this is still in the, uh, in the real world, as it were. This is when they're up in the mountains. We can see 3rd Squad having their start of their trouble with Lieutenant Martin. This is Oscar asking if Lieutenant Martin really wants trouble. Chapter 25 is most interesting just for this very simple contrast. We have this contrast between Paul Berlin and Lieutenant Sidney Martin. And we have Lieutenant Sidney Martin watching Paul, and it says he admires the persistence of with which the last soldier, that's Paul, is marching. But at the same time, it says Paul had no sense of the lieutenant's sentiment. He was dull of mind, blunt of spirit, numb of history. And so we have this very interesting division, this contrast between the leaders and their ideas and the soldiers and their reality. And again, we have this split between idea and reality showing up again in a slightly smaller way, but it's still interesting to look at in terms of none of what Lieutenant Sidney Martin is thinking is actually true. Paul is just walking up the mountain because he's being told to walk up the mountain. There's no greater, um, there's no greater persistence or nobility behind that. Repose on the road to Paris. Repose is a word that means rest. 
This is resting on the road to Paris. Again, we find that the fantasy has stalled. They've gotten stuck. His story has lost its momentum. All of these are examples of the fantasy really having gotten off track and slowed down. They're no longer moving towards Paris. The momentum is gone. He's lost the reason. There's too many side stories. There's too much stuff for him to do with Sarkin. And his fantasy has really gotten out of hand. And he even asks himself this. What the hell was he doing here? He's gotten himself stuck in this story. He can't move forward. They lost the trail. He doesn't know how to pick it back up again. And so again, he creates a reason to move on. Improbably, impossibly, they find Cacciato's face in a picture in the newspaper, and that gives them a reason to move on and to move forward. It's worth pointing out that we have some evidence of Paul Berlin's guilt in this chapter. Remember, this is a Paris chapter, so it's not happening. But Lieutenant Corson, in Paul's imagination, reminds them of what they did to Lieutenant Martin. He says, really, you need me like you needed Lieutenant Martin? Paul is still struggling with this guilt. He knows what they did to Lieutenant Martin. He knows they fragged him, and it's something that he is struggling with and attempting to come to terms with. Flights of Imagination, Chapter 27. Getting stuck in that lull, we see Paul again. He speeds up the narrative. It was a newer, faster train. Things are moving faster now. They found Cacciato. They are on the trail. They have a fast train. The whole story is going to take place at a little bit faster rate of speed. All of this is symbolized by this fast train that they're on. The flights of imagination are interesting because, again, we slide back into the real war. Uh, even though this is not labeled as such, it is a Paris chapter. It is a fantasy chapter still. But we learn that during the battle in World's Greatest Lake Country, as they were making all the craters on the mountain, that again, we find Paul hiding. We find this cowardice in our main character. That he's hiding during one of the big battles during the war. During the one big battle, it's actually called the only big battle during the war. He thinks about that, remembers himself hiding out, and then we fall back into his imagination. Uh, and the mayor of the town of... Ossival tells him, uh, in his own imagination, I cannot tell unmade histories. He tells Paul, you've done nothing yet. You're a 20-year-old. You have no history. You haven't accomplished anything. And this is an indictment against Paul. This is really calling Paul out for being the kind of unimpressive person that he is. And this continues over into chapter 28, where we really see... Paul as the unimpressive, unaccomplished, underachieving person that he is. His teachers call him standoffish and shy. He almost had a girlfriend. He pretended to kiss her. He enrolled at junior college and earned 28 credits and then quit. 28 credits, probably about one year worth of credits, uh, maybe one and a half, assuming that you earn, you know, 9 to 12 credits a year, uh, somewhere in that range. Paul Berlin is not an impressive kid. He's 20 years old. He doesn't have a lot going on right now. We already know he feels like he's a coward. And he can't look back on his life and see anything. And he says in chapter 28 that, sure, he had a history, but you notice that observation post chapter takes up less than two pages. Whatever his history is, it can be written in less than two pages. That's clearly not much of a history at all. Chapter 29, Atrocities on the Road to Paris. Once again, we're back in the Paris chapters. All of a sudden, we've transitioned all the way out to Tehran. So we've moved all the way to Iran, outside of India. Our story is now moving at a faster rate of speed, like we talked about. We know that Lieutenant Corson uh, is getting sick. He doesn't feel well. Uh, but it says that what he's suffering from is nostalgia. Uh, he's missing the war. He misses that fight. This is Paul's own imagination kind of fighting against him that you can't drag a lifelong lieutenant along with you, that he's going to get lonely and miss the things that he's comfortable with. 
it's kind of interesting to see how Paul's mind, this is all happening in Paul's mind, how Paul's mind is kind of fighting against him and showing him the problems with his own story. Then Paul imagines that they encounter this beheading. Tehran was kind of known for its severe forms of punishment. Uh, they, they're beheading this young man. Dot calls it a spectacle of civilization. Now, spectacle is a very interesting word. If you look up the word spectacle, you will see that it means made to be seen. So a spectacle is something that's done in order for people to see it, to prove a point so that other people can notice it. And he calls it a spectacle of civilization. So my question for you, and this is a question that you can complete a goal contract for or earn extra credit by posting on the blog, is does civilization require these public acts of punishment? In what way would this spectacle, in what way would this beheading be something that was made to be seen? Why is it something that people would need to see? That is a question that you can answer to complete your goal contract or to earn some extra credit. Even in Paul's fantasy, we notice like reality, his own mind is fighting back against him. Things, problems are occurring. He's realizing that this fantasy is not as likely as he wants it to be. Most of chapter 29 has to do with them being arrested and asked a bunch of questions. We could go into it, but it's, it's Paul's mind fighting back against him. It's his own cowardice kind of catching up with him. They're caught, right? His cowardice still comes out again because he's scared that they end up getting caught. They're going to get in trouble. None of this is going to work out. This is all of Paul's fears kind of coming to bear. Our last chapter, chapter 30, uh, just under an hour has passed. It's just about eight minutes to four, we're told. So it's 3.58 in the morning. Paul is still contemplating the possibilities, but even he is wondering why did it lead to a beheading in Tehran? And you have to think about if you have a path that has a decision, and then you take this path and it has another decision, and then another decision, and then another decision, and another decision, and another decision. At a certain point, you end up up here, but you could have just as easily, if you had taken this path, all of a sudden you have all of these options. And so Paul's trying to figure out why it is that they went this way instead of maybe going this way. And really starting to think about in his own imagination what happens whenever you start to just make things up and all of the possible futures that could have happened. What happens if he doesn't kill Ketchato? What happens if he trips running up the hill? What happens if his rifle jams? He's thinking all these things through. These possibilities are not just his fictional chapters. They're also dealing with with Cacciato and him struggling to understand how this could have happened. We finally get a correct order of deaths. We see this Billy Boy and then Rudy and Frenchie and Bernie and Reddy Mix and Buff and Lieutenant Martin. And then finally Jim Pedersen is the last one to be killed. The person not on here, of course, is our title character. Cacciato is not listed, but he then would die last. And we're told that Paul Berlin had witnessed the ultimate war story on his first day. Uh, that is Billy Boy stepping on the mine, blowing off his own foot, and then dying out of panic and sheer fright. That is the ultimate war story. That is chapters 19 through 30. Lots of stuff happens. Paul Berlin's narrative starts to slow down, he speeds it back up, he starts to really become aware of the sheer magnitude of possibilities that he's involved himself with. All kinds of interesting things happen. Please don't forget to take the quiz after you've watched this lecture. Don't forget to post a comment on the blog for extra credit or a goal contract signed if you answer that question in a meaningful way. And have a good night. Mr. Miller out.